Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of ESG CT's Ask the Expert. Today, we have a very interesting topic, and we'll be covering careers in science publishing. And if you're joining us for the first time, we would just like to inform you that this is a very interactive career session. A, our target audience are young researchers, so either you're towards the end of your master's, going into your PhD, your any spectrum you are from your PhD to an early postdoc, then this is definitely the program for you, especially if you're trying to figure out what to do after you've finished your studies. So every time we have this program, we try to highlight different science-based careers, predominantly in the field of gene and cell therapy, because we're the European Society of Gene and Cell Therapy, of course, and we hope that you can benefit from the information that we provide. So as we go along, you will have an option to be able to ask your questions and we will inform you about those procedures shortly. So I'm Vanessa, I'm one of the student board members for the ESGCT and I co-host this program with Irini, who will now introduce our very amazing speaker for today. Good morning from me. It's good morning from Seattle. And I think good morning from Kevin as well. I mean, without further ado, I'm so excited um, to announce this speaker of this month. Uh, this time we will move a bit towards uh, scientific writing. I think like Kevin has such an astonishing background, um, very academic to begin with. And that's why I think it's going to be very interesting to follow his career journey because he did uh, his undergrad in Oxford. So I teased him because I went to Cambridge and then he did his PhD, was it UCL, then a postdoc in MIT, Harvard. So as you can see, he has like a very academic background, but then he moved towards um, like a more writing great career. He's the founding editor of Nature Genetics and also the author of Editing Humanity and the $1,000 Genome, which is funny because like I knew of the book, but I never thought I would be speaking with the author. So we're all... <laughs> to have it's true <laughs> it's, uh, we're, we're like we were very excited to we're very excited to have you and we're looking forward to your presentation so kevin will just start sharing his presentation and just want to remind you all that meanwhile you can be sending us your questions because this event is exactly like vanessa said it's all uh for you for the younger uh scientists so let's do it kevin Great, Irini and Vanessa, thank you so much for uh, the invitation and the chance to tell you about my own journey in uh, science publishing uh, and uh, my, my decision to leave uh, the bench after a pretty abysmal postdoc or two, um, and hopefully share some of the kind of crossroads that I, I faced and um, maybe help you figure out your own um, decisions that you will be making or have to make in your career path. So uh, let's uh, hit the uh, share button here. And um, get our little show underway. Uh, there we go. Um, look forward to your taking your questions at the end of this, uh, this short presentation. So um, yeah, over 30 years, just over 30 years now in science publishing, I've it's been a fun ride because I've been able to stay in science and enjoy uh, many of the uh, benefits and uh, positives of working uh, at uh, leading journal, science journal publishers like Nature and Cell Press um, and writing books about uh, amazing advances in, in genetics and genomics. Uh, in books like Cracking the Genome, The Thousand Dollar Genome, and now most recently, Editing Humanity, about the CRISPR revolution. Um, but none of this was planned. All of this came about because my original plans and aspirations to become a, a, a rock star professor at some prestigious university somewhere uh, really crashed and burned at the bench uh, for reasons that I'll quickly uh, and shortly get into. And I needed another way out. I needed a way to stay in science because that was the only thing I, I had trained in uh, back in the UK, uh, but to find a way to uh, use my, my passion and interest in science uh, without having the, 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 the tedium and the, 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 the constant failure of trying experiments that were uh, beyond my, my meager skills as an experimental uh, researcher. 
So let me begin just showing you that there was a, once upon a time, I was a, a lab coat wearing uh, medical or, or molecular geneticist. This is the cystic fibrosis team uh, in the mid 1980s at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School uh, in, in London, just down the road from Paddington Station, famous for being the site where Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. Um, and in this photo, uh, you can see uh, there's, a, you know it's old because this is the little radiation monitor that we were wear or wore on our lapels to make sure we weren't splashing too much radioactive P32 as we were doing our Sanger sequencing uh, gels. So you can also tell it's old from the very uh, dodgy haircuts that uh, most of the men are wearing in this. Now, most of the folks here are still very active and successful in their research careers. Uh, Pete's a medical geneticist, Martin a bioinformatician, Brandon runs a, a major molecular biology, biotechnology center back in his native Australia. Nick is the co-founder of a leading genomic medicine company in the UK. And Jill is the vice, team, vice dean of research at University College London. So. Most of the folks that I grew up with uh, and did my PhD with are still having spectacular success and careers in research. And if that's your dream, I really hope that you succeed in doing it because there's there are a few feelings as, as euphoric and as satisfying as making that, that discovery, that advance at the bench and then writing it up and sharing it with the world in a, in a journal and, and hopefully using that research to uh, either further some, uh, some new area of biological research or perhaps uh, help patients with some devastating disease. And certainly that we came to work inspired by the thought that we might one day help um, playing, playing genetic detectives, we might help patients with a terrible disease like cystic fibrosis. And ultimately, this team uh, will run us up in the race to find the gene. Of course, you know that it was identified by Labchi Choi in Toronto, uh, aided by Francis Collins, who went on, of course, to become the director of the NIH. Uh, but when I graduated or got my PhD in 1987, I thought uh, I still wanted to continue in, in uh, uh, do a postdoc. I wanted to go somewhere, uh, some another prestigious school, hopefully somewhere in America. So I, I went to uh, the Whitehead Institute in in uh, in Boston. Um, one funny story though, before I get there, and that is that. In, before I joined the group in London, I turned down the opportunity to go to Leicester to interview with a, a relatively unknown scientist at that time, because Leicester wasn't London. What's in Leicester? I just did, I really didn't want to uh, fancy spending three or four years living there. Um, but the opportunity I turned down was to interview with Alec Jeffries, now Sir Alec Jeffries, who was on the verge of discovering DNA fingerprinting. And I do occasionally harken back to those days and wonder, wow, well, what, what if I'd been in you know, the leading grad student in his group? Maybe that would have been me uh, driving the DNA fingerprinting uh, uh, research. But I try not to dwell on these sorts of things uh, too long. Um, so in 87, I uh, moved to Boston uh, because I'd met a, a researcher who came to London to give a lecture, Harvey Lodish, um, and uh, asked if I could do a postdoc potentially in his lab. And he said, well, if you can get the money, you can come to my lab. And so I worked hard to find a fellowship. And then uh, the, literally the first day walking into Harvey's lab, he sat me down and said, Kevin, I've got some, some rather disappointing news. Um, that gene you were gonna clone over the next two years, I'm afraid I'm reviewing a paper for nature. Uh, it's been cloned, you've been scooped. And that was a setback from which I never, never really recovered. Um, but I think even if that hadn't happened, I don't know that I was so motivated and so passionate to know what the structure of the sodium glucose co-transporter was that, that uh, I just think I would have been better off talking to friends and family and really f trying to figure out what, what's the kind of research that you want, you're going to be most happy and most uh, motivated. Um, this was more of a convenient place because I was able to write a, f a fellowship application and get funded. And if you're doing molecular or medical research, I don't think those those are the right parameters. It really should be because you want to ask a question um, that, that you must know the answer to. Um, and so I wish I'd been a little more open with, with friends and family and my, my PhD supervisor, um, because I think if they'd asked me some to be honest with myself and ask some questions about where I was going and what I wanted to do, I probably would have come to a different conclusion. So that's one of my big takeaways is make sure you're talking about your future plans and aspirations with everybody in your circle, because um, I think they'll help challenge your assumptions and maybe maybe force you to make question some of the decisions that you're planning uh, to make. 
So in the second year of my postdoc, with no experiments working, nothing looking good, I was really getting a little worried for what I was going to do. And then the gene for cystic fibrosis was identified, as I mentioned, in, in the summer of 1989. And I thought, well, hang on, I know this story about as well as anybody else. I lived and breathed CF for three or four years while I was in London. Maybe I could share that story for a, a broader audience. So I pitched this idea uh, to the editor of uh, New Scientist or the science editor of New Scientist magazine in London. And to my delight, they said, sure, give it a go. And a couple of months later, this article, my first big freelance article was published in New Scientist. Um, and I'm really grateful for the, to them, not only because it gave me a validation uh, that I wasn't getting uh, in the lab, uh, and also it gave me the confidence to think, wow, this science publishing gig, this is fun. I think I, I could be quite good at this. So let's see what else is out there. And it was about that time that this article came out that an advertisement appeared in the back of Nature to join Nature magazine. And that was the closest moment that I came to a eureka moment in the lab, uh, seeing that job advertisement. That was my escape route away uh, from the bench and to, to hang up the lab coat once and for all. So I applied for that uh, job at, uh, at Nature. Uh, I was interviewed by uh, this gentleman, uh, John Maddox, who uh, passed away uh, some years ago, um, now the, the editor emeritus of Nature, uh, together with some of his senior colleagues at a, at a conference that they were hosting in Boston. Uh, it was a breakfast meeting and after a, 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 what was obviously a, a, a good interview, um, he asked me to wait in the lobby and then came out and said, Kevin, we'd like to offer you the job of uh, assistant editor on the biology team um, of, uh, of Nature. And he offered me a right there and then a, a, the, the job and a starting salary of $32,500, which at the time, and given my, my meager uh, postdoctoral uh, fellowship stipend, I thought that was an absolute fortune. So I accepted the job on the spot and later realized I made a big mistake, not in accepting the job, but doing it on the spot. Don't ever do that. Don't ever make my mistake. Um, it's, it's highly unlikely that any employer, whether it's a publisher or anyone else, is gonna make their best offer, their, their first offer for you. So go away, sleep on it, and then come back to them and ask, you know, what, what else can you do for me? Is there a, a signing bonus or a help with relocation? Or can you improve the salary or the benefits? Uh, uh, if it's, a, if it's a, a research company, what about some stock options? Uh, what about more stock options? So always negotiate. What's the, the worst they can come back to you is say no. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm glad I accepted the gig for, for reasons that will become apparent. This is, a, I'm fond of this photo that was uh, on, the, on the cover of Nature that marked John's obituary, uh, because this was the cramped office uh, where he used to write his editorials before they moved to their much swankier headquarters in King's Cross. This was just off Fleet Street. And uh, you can see the, the pack of Marlborough, which were uh, ever present in, in the lab. There was usually a couple of bottles of wine sitting on the windowsill here when uh, he needed inspiration and fuel to write his late night uh, weekly uh, editorials. Um, a year later, another big break, uh, I was given the chance to write a business plan for a new journal, the first Nature spin-off journal. Uh, the, the management thought about whether it should be in neuroscience or cell biology or molecular biology and quickly decided it should be in genetics, partly because the Human Genome Project had just launched. So we knew there would be a, 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 an explosion of papers and new companies and there'd be lots to talk about from the, from, from the basic research and the technology developments of the Human Genome Project. But also because it turns out that in human genetics, which was my responsibility as a young new editor on the Nature Biology team, which was only half a dozen people, um, I was frequently butting heads with my colleagues because papers would come on my desk that I had the job of evaluating and maybe advocating for uh, and shepherding uh, through the peer review process. And more and more occasions happened where I thought a paper belonged in Nature, but my colleagues would shake their heads disapprovingly and say, no, they didn't think it, it met uh, Nature's criteria, which were really two, just two major criteria. A, is this a major significant advance for the field? And B, is this of general interest to people beyond the, the, uh, the field or the subdiscipline that this paper is in? And I remember one example, uh, the mapping of the gene for familial ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in 1991. This is of course Lou Gehrig's disease. The disease was named after an American sporting icon, 
And I thought this absolutely was of general interest because we knew nothing about motor neuron disease. And this had to be a huge breakthrough for the field, whether in genetics or any other aspect of the, of the research. Um, but uh, my colleagues uh, sort of said, no, they didn't think this was amounted to a nature paper. And it ended up being published in the New England Journal of Medicine, not exactly a specialized journal. And so I was keeping a little diary of more and more of these examples of big papers, exciting papers that I felt warranted or deserved the nature name attached to them, um, but they weren't, uh, they weren't given that opportunity. So I was able in the business plan to say, here's a mock table of contents from papers we've let go over the last year or so that surely belong in a journal that would aspire to uh, carry the nature name, nature genetics. Uh, we approved the journal or my, my, my bosses approved the launch of the journal, Thanksgiving week, 1991. And I was given four months to get the journal off the ground. Um, and it proved to be a runaway success. Here's the first article rolling off the presses. Uh, Anne Martin was our, our production editor. Um, uh, and um, I wrote a, submitted an editorial which John Maddox vetoed. It was the only time he interfered with anything to do with nature genetics. So he wrote the uh, the first the editorial for the first issue, and uh, and I took the took the the, the reins after that. Um, so and of course, Nature Genetics has provided the template for a whole uh, uh, portfolio, a franchise of nature journals, literally dozens now of nature journals, nature review journals, um, nature portfolio uh, journals, and Nature Genetics really got that ball ball rolling. If you want more information and insights on how we made that decision and what, what the, 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 the circumstances were like, uh, on the 15th anniversary of the launch of Nature Genetics, I wrote this commentary, Nature, Genetics, and the Niven Factor. You'll have to read this to understand what the Niven Factor stood for. Um, and here's the URL. Um, uh, this, this has the whole, the whole scoop. So on Nature Genetics' first birthday in 1993, I organized a, a conference, a two-day affair, uh, with, it was just a, a, an A-list a lineup of Francis Collins and Craig Venter and Mary Claire King, uh, and uh, enjoyed, have enjoyed ever since planning uh, conferences for, for uh, Nature and BioIT World and uh, uh, other, other venues. It's, it's one of the perks of, of being a journal editor is you get to uh, travel a lot and plan a lot of conferences where you can invite your friends and uh, some, some, some major talent, Derek Lander here. Linda Avey, the co-founder of 23andMe at other events that I've helped organize over the years. And much of my career has been spent at di different publishers, launching journals, um, trying to kind of recapture the magic that we had when we launched Nature Genetics in 1992. So I joined Cell Press shortly after Cell was acquired by Elsevier, uh, an interesting time in the company's history. Um, I was quickly uh, promoted to editor-in-chief and we one of, the, one of the tasks was to take that Cell name, that brand that Elsevier had paid big money for, and try to uh, launch some new new titles. And I think the biggest one we launched in the time I was there uh, is Cancer Cell, which is still one, has become one of the top journals in the cancer research field. A decade later at the American Chemical Society, a big nonprofit in Washington, DC, we launched ACS Central Science. Chemists love to view their field as the central science. Um, and ACS Central Science was an interdisciplinary, fully open access journal edited by Carolyn Bertozzi, uh, a leading scientist at, uh, at Stanford. Uh, so we had a lot of fun launching that journal. And most recently, of course, uh, the CRISPR journal. I'll say a bit more about this um, at the end. Uh, the CRISPR journal is a sister journal to Human Gene Therapy, which of course is the, the journal, um, uh, the gene therapy journal affiliated uh, with um, the uh, ESGCT, uh, both published by uh, the Marianne Liebert Publishing Company just outside New York. So why did I move into journal editing and why would, should you maybe Consider it. Here are some of the perks of, of this uh, career. It, uh, for one thing, it allows you to stay abreast of a much broader area of science than you might feel constrained in your, in your current research, whether you're a grad student or doing a postdoc. Uh, one of the issues you may be facing is you may feel that you're, you're missing out on other science that is going on. And if you become a journal editor, you're sort of obliged to be staying up on really the whole of genetics or the whole of gene therapy or whatever your, your field might be. Um, I found that it 
instantly elevated you to the point that uh, uh, leading scientists around the world would happily take your phone calls or invite you to visit their department or their lab or, or have a cup of coffee with you at a, at a conference um, because you became suddenly a pretty important person. You're now the gatekeeper if you're at a, a nature journal or a cell or a science journal, for example, where you're the first barrier to entry, first barrier to publication. It's your sense of whether this work is exciting, important, novel, significant. Uh, if you're not convinced by that, then you're, you have the power to reject that paper. So uh, a lot of researchers are going to want to know who you are and uh, have friendly conversations with you to, uh, to insist that their work is worthy of, uh, of getting published in one of these journals. Lots of travel to conferences, lab visits, giving talks uh, uh, around the country, around, uh, around the continent. Um, and while you may miss the, the visceral thrill of making that discovery that uh, uh, is going to change uh, science or advance your field, there's still plenty of thrills as you, uh, uh, in hot fields, you maybe are trying to uh, uh, get shepherd your paper to publication before somebody's rivals uh, end up getting published in, in, a, in a rival uh, or competing journal. So, so there's still that, that thrill of the chase and the thrill of seeing your paper uh, be, becoming published before anyone else. And there are so many more opportunities now in moving into this field than there were 20 years ago. I looked on Nature Jobs uh, under the search term editor this morning. There are 43 jobs currently available, and most of them are in science publishing. One or two are in CRISPR or gene editing, so I have to be careful when I do that search anymore. But um, uh, compared to the when I was looking 30 years ago, and there was really just Nature, maybe Cell, uh, maybe science, but pretty much those three. And now uh, at PLOS, uh, the Trends Journals, uh, BMC, Frontiers, there's so many more publishers that have professional editors. And of course, Nature has uh, literally dozens of journals looking for full-time professional editors and much more flexibility about where those positions are based now. It doesn't have to just be in London or New York. Um, and as I'll end in a minute, uh, it's a great stepping stone to many other careers. This is not a one-way ticket where you're now stuck in reading papers and, and doing journal editing. Um, this is a great stepping stone to move into uh, foundations or, or ad administration and other careers. And I'll give you examples at the end. So let me just, if you want to, if you're thinking that this may be something you want to try, one piece of advice is, uh, give it a go. If you haven't written a review, you're going to be writing a review, big review article or chapters for your thesis. Uh, have you tried to publish a review or a mini review? It doesn't have to be in cell or science or nature. What about uh, one of the trends journals or current biology? There's so many, or PLOS, there's so many, eLife, there's so many good journals and so many editors at those journals looking for people to suggest uh, mini review topics. Uh, they believe me, they don't want to do all the commissioning themselves. They would love it if a smart young grad student or postdoc were to email an editor to say, I've got a great idea for a mini review or a commentary because um, I've just seen this great paper or this paper has been buried in a specialized journal and no one's seen it and it's absolutely fantastic. Share that story with another, with a bigger audience. Um, you may want to do what I did and pitch some more popular science types of stories to a, a magazine like New Scientist or Genetic Engineering News, where, I, where I'm currently affiliated. And maybe you can raise your own pri profile on social media. So lots of little things you can do um, so that if you do end up applying for a job, um, somebody like me who's going to be looking at your resume has something that says, we can see something that says, You've, you've obviously had an interest sort of nagging away, and this is how you've, you've taken those first steps uh, to showing your interest in science communication or, or journal publishing. Now, I want to say a little bit about uh, book writing, because I, that wasn't part of the master plan when I applied to Nature. Um, but um, when I did the first Nature Genetics Conference in 1993, I had dinner with sitting next to Mary Claire King. And I was so inspired by her own personal story and the work that she was doing in, to search for the hereditary breast cancer gene, BRCA1, that I thought to myself, wow, that, that feels like a medical thriller, detective story. I'd love to write a book on that. Now, uh, uh, 10 years earlier or thereabouts, I'd been playing uh, in a band uh, during my PhD. Maybe this is why my, why my PhD wasn't very good because most weekends I'd be off uh, playing playing in a band called Color Me Pop. You can still find this uh, 
this record on YouTube, if you look hard enough. Um, and uh, Mike White, the leader of the group, uh, had become a published author. So I called him up and said, uh, I need advice. How can I, how can I go about writing a book about uh, Mary Claire King and the race for the breast cancer gene? And he said, Kevin, I would love to write that book with you as your co-author. That wasn't exactly my intention, but it seemed to make sense. He'd written a biography of Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist. So we got our first book uh, published. It did, didn't earn any records. It didn't sell many copies, but uh, that, that was an exciting moment in 1995. A few years later, I received a call. Um, I'd left Nature Genetics. I was working at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and I received a call out of the blue from a, a literary agent um, uh, who said she was rep interested in representing a, a professor, an assistant professor at Columbia University uh, in New York, Angela Cristiano, who had discovered uh, the first gene for hereditary baldness. And, and uh, the agent thought this was an amazing story and she had an amazing personal story. Would I be interested in ghostwriting this, uh, this book uh, with her? Um, and I knew Angela and she she suggested me as a potential ghostwriter for her book. That idea didn't go anywhere. Angela had second thoughts. Uh, she was just a young assist, uh, assistant professor, perhaps a little too soon to be writing the big book about uh, her personal journey and hair loss. But since I had a, a bona fide a literary agent on the phone, I said, well, actually, you know what? I've got another idea. Um, what about the Human Genome Project? This is turning into a real medical thriller. Craig Venter has just announced he's going to launch a company to take on the Human Genome Project. Now, that's a book I would really like to write. And so uh, my agent said, um, sure, when can you start? Let's see. I need a proposal and then we'll pitch it. So that book became... Uh, cracking the genome. That was this is my first solo endeavor. It was called the Sequence in the UK and in Germany, uh, and it uh, was published in, in, in a number of different languages. And I'm still quite proud of this. That was the first real book on the uh, the genesis and history of the Human Genome Project. Um, and really sort of gave me the confidence to begin thinking about other books. Um, I thought about then the breakthroughs in DNA sequencing and next-gen sequencing and personal genome sequencing. Uh, nothing quite um, catalyzed into a book proposal until um, I read that Jim Watson was having his genome sequenced and companies like 23andMe were getting launched to, to give rise to this new consumer genetics uh, revolution. In, and that was in 2007. So that suddenly, all those ideas coalesced into a book proposal for the thousand dollar genome. I love that term. And so that was my second book. Uh, I did a book, uh, the invitation of uh, an updated version of a book called DNA with uh, Jim Watson, and then um, became really enamored of CRISPR. And that was my most recent book. I'll say a bit more about that uh, in a second. Um, Here's the real meet my first proper meeting with with Jim Watson at a plenary session at the American Society for Human Genetics in 2011. Uh, I don't think I've ever been more petrified walking on stage in my life in front of 7,000 people. Uh, but uh, I gave uh, Jim a copy of the the thousand dollar genome, and two years later he called me out of the blue and said, "Can we have dinner? I'd like you to be a ghostwriter for the second edition of his book uh, DNA." So. Uh, funny things can happen. Um, uh, uh, speaking of funny things, um, this was a, an invitation completely out of the blue. So I've completely forgotten about the book on the race for the breast cancer gene. Um, this book didn't sell in vast numbers because when BRCA1 was sequenced and published, um, the, the, the gene sequence itself did, wasn't the eureka moment that investigators had been hoping for. And of course, Mary Claire King had been scooped by Myriad Genetics. So um, uh, the story didn't have quite the narrative appeal that I was uh, uh, hoping for. So I'd, I thought everyone had forgotten about this book. And then I got a call out of the blue from uh, a film director in Hollywood, Steve Bernstein, who said he was making a film called Decoding Annie Parker, and uh, he wanted me to be a technical consultant or script consultant for this book because it was going to tell uh, that Mary Claire King was involved in the story, 
uh, and um, so they wanted, it wasn't exactly based on my book, but they wanted to use some of the themes in my book. And they said that Helen Hunt would uh, you know, maybe be, be calling you to kind of get inside her character. Sadly, that never happened. She, her filming was already uh, completed in a matter of a few days, but I did visit the set and that was a great thrill. Um, uh, although uh, when I had brought my edits or suggestions, having read the script, to these two script writers, uh, they gave me very short shrift and said, look, this is not a documentary. We've got no time to film this. It's being done on a shoestring budget. Um, so, you know, send us your suggestions, but chances are we're gonna politely decline pretty much anything that you have to say. So that may explain why when the credits rolled on the film, I was literally buried at the end of the, of the, 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 uh, the cast. Um, as the genetics consultant, literally underneath uh, Aaron Paul's uh, guitar coach. So, um, and that was, he was only on playing the guitar, strumming the guitar for 10 seconds in the movie, but a fun experience nonetheless. So uh, quickly to close, um, the last uh, chapter of my, my uh, career, still a going concern, but it has been to uh, launch um, the CRISPR journal. So I was late to the party with CRISPR. I missed all the buzz about gene editing when the big papers were being published in 2012, 2013. Um, and I only rather belatedly came to this story. But um, in 2017, when I was looking for a new position, um, a friend suggested I talk to the publishers at Marianne Liebert in New York. And I came to them really enamored with um, this idea that uh, CRISPR, this gene editing technology, was going to become a groundbreaking, game-changing technology. And there was enough substance and enough momentum behind it to merit the launch of a new journal dedicated to CRISPR. And uh, Marianne Liebert, uh, the uh, owner of the company, and Marianne Russell, the president of the firm, uh, took me to dinner and clicked their fingers almost immediately and said, this is a great idea, let's, let's do it. And so I signed on very quickly to do that. We launched the journal in early 2018 and uh, it seems to be gathering momentum and is publishing some cool papers in, in genome editing. But uh, at the same time, I also was interested in writing, I thought it's not just a journal I want to write, I really want to write the story of CRISPR. Um, and so I applied for a, a Guggenheim uh, fellowship, um, uh, having met uh, an old friend from Nature, who is the Dean at Cold Spring Harbor. He just received one of these awards. And I said, what, for writing a science book? That's, I had no idea they offered that sort of thing. Um, so I was inspired by uh, Alex Gann to put in my own proposal. And uh, somewhat to my surprise, because most of these awards go for things like um, uh, the, in the arts and, and choreographers and uh, uh, things like this. But they have a few awards for, for science writing and I was lucky enough to win one of these, which really gave me the momentum and the confidence to go ahead and start working on a book on CRISPR, in addition to uh, launching the CRISPR journal. Uh, so uh, at conferences in Europe and North America and elsewhere, I met the who's who of the CRISPR world. Here's me work, uh, looking, uh, meeting uh, Francis Mo Francisco Mojica from the University of Alicante uh, at one of the, uh, um, uh, the, the Sultans of Santa Pola. It's a huge salt extraction factory just south of Alicante um, uh, where uh, uh, some of the first, uh, uh, and of course Francisco was one of the first people to discover the, uh, the phenomenon of CRISPR repeats and make the connection with uh, uh, microbial uh, uh, defense uh, systems. Um, meeting Francisco, I recorded an interview with him and that became the first of a podcast series that we've launched called Guideposts, which you can find on, um, uh, on, on all the popular uh, uh, podcast uh, platforms. Um, and I still, it's fun interviewing luminaries like David Liu and Dame K. Davis about different aspects of genome editing uh, and uh, the, next, the next version of uh, CRISPR. And the book really kind of climaxed when I went to Hong Kong at the end of 2018 uh, for this uh, symposium, uh, unaware uh, when I 
left New York that uh, uh, her Jankui was going to be giving a presentation talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the CRISPR babies, um, the gene edited uh, twins, Lulu and Nana. Uh, so here I am, you can see my bald head uh, in the front row here um, and uh, recognizing that this was an absolute game changing moment in science and medicine and um, really planting the seeds for a book on, uh, on uh, CRISPR. And that book came out last year. It's called Editing Humanity. Uh, I had the thrill of narrating the audio book, something I'd always wanted to do. I'd never been invited before, uh, but uh, they must have liked the sound of what's left of my British accent or something. So I got to narrate the audio book. And this came out, um, it was published in uh, uh, October of 2020, literally one day before Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier won the Nobel Prize for CRISPR. So um, I've had a very fun journey in scientific publishing and have no, no regrets about leaving the bench and, and the feeling is mutual. <laughs> the bench hasn't missed me at all. And I thought about where, where have people who've pursued that sort of line of career, where are they now? Uh, many have left science publishing uh, but gone on to do great things, uh, running as senior administrators or deans of graduate programs at Cold Spring Harbor, um, uh, Harvard Medical School, the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, program directors at the uh, different institutes within the NIH, program officers at medical foundations, including HHMI, the Simons Foundation, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, some have become, have left journal editing and just become very successful book authors, uh, Phil Ball, Gabrielle Walker, some have gone into industry, um, some are still working in, in uh, uh, science communications, um, others are still in journal editing and publishing, including um, the current editor of Nature, who had a similar career path to me, did a postdoc, decided to join Nature and, and get out of, get away from the bench. And uh, 20 years later, Magdalena Skipper is the chief editor of Nature and the first uh, woman to hold that position. So I'm, I'm very proud of her accomplishments. But many others are still, including some very close friends, are still doing great stuff at the New England Journal of Medicine, current biology, giga science, and elsewhere. Some have left science altogether and are professional musicians or high school teachers, and one or two have gone back to the lab. So it's a very, it's not a one-way street. You can go do journal editing for a little bit and then uh, go off and either bounce back to the lab or, or wherever. So my final slide is to just give a few parting thoughts and a few, a few tips. Um, uh, talk about your plans uh, in research with friends and family, peers and, and mentors. Um, I didn't do that enough. And um, help them, let them challenge you and figure out, are you in the right field? Do you really want to stay in research? It's uh, many sacrifices to become a, an academic researcher. Do you want to go into industry? Um, the more you talk about this with friends and family, I think that the clearer your own uh, motivations and priorities will become. Um, if you're interested in science publishing, well, give it a go. Uh, I, there's no formal training required. It's if, if you enjoy writing or enjoy talking science, enjoy reading papers, then you may have the aptitude to move into some sort of career in science publishing. And as I've shown you, there's so many more opportunities now than there were 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I like this quote from Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So yeah, what's, what's the worst that they can, they can say? Um, you know, apply and, and, and give it a go. Um, if you don't ask, you don't get. So uh, don't ever accept a job offer on the spot. Go away, think about it, talk about it with friends and family. And um, almost certainly whatever you've been offered isn't maybe the, you know, the, the, the best offer that they can make. So um, ask for a little bit more. You'll be surprised how much they can, they can give. And finally, as you've seen in that previous slide, um, journal publishing uh, and science communication, it's a it's a ticket to move into many other fields, whether it be administration or, 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 or other areas. So I found it to be a, a, a fulfilling and a stimulating career. And I think if, if that's a decision that you want to make, uh, chances are you won't regret it. So, uh, I wish Editing Humanity was available in many more languages compared to the way that some of my other books have been translated, but we're still, we're still working on that. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of the response it's uh, received. It's out now in paperback here in, in North America. Uh, you can reach me here. I'd love to uh, 
talk to you and I'd love to take your questions uh, in, in the time that we have left. So uh, thank you for your attention and, and uh, whether you stay in research or decide to pursue some other alternative career in science communication or science publishing, obviously I wish you nothing but the best. And I'll leave it there. Perfect. Thank you, Kevin. I mean, I, I don't know what to say for like taking the time to create such a nice PowerPoint presentation. I think it's always so important where people take the time to take us through their personal journey because you know, you're like in such, people can be in such an early career and have a similar moments of like, I'm stuck. I don't know how to move forward. And I think a lot of the times we take people that are successful and we look at them only in that final stage of their career. And we forget that they probably had similar struggles, you know? So I think that's always very important. And that's why we're doing this kind of like, yeah, going through everyone's journey. So the first question I wanted um, to ask has more to do with what is a daily like routine for you? Because we are trained to be lab-based scientists. So that's something we're all very familiar with, but I have no idea what is the day of someone who is like in publishing, writing, editing. Well, as an entry level, uh, if you were to apply for and take a job with Cell Press or Science or Nature or many other publishers. It doesn't have to be the big three. Many more uh, publishers, uh, outfits like eLife or Embo um, are, have positions for full-time professional editors. So, I mean, in, in some respects, it's a dream job. You get to, for the most part, read and evaluate and make decisions, make editorial decisions on scientific manuscripts. I think that's it at, the, at its core. Uh, so you have the privilege of reading papers before they're published. They may have been pre-printed now. That's a big difference from when I, I was uh, starting out in my career. So obviously more and more papers are already being exposed. But um, in terms of formal submission to a journal, you're one of the first people outside of the authors and maybe you know the author's family um, to, to glimpse this paper. And maybe you feel this is a real breakthrough in the making. So you get to judge the scientific and interest level of that work. And one of the first decisions you have to make is, is this something we're gonna send out for peer review? Is, does this meet the editorial criteria for my journal, whether I'm working for a big glamour journal or a, a more specialized journal? Uh, and that's something you come to terms with with, with your colleagues. Um, if you decide it is worth sending out for review, you've got to pick the referees. You've got to find people who are available, who have uh, complementary strengths. So you make sure that you don't be accepting a paper and then belatedly realize, whoops, we, we didn't cover some important technical aspect of the work and then have mud on our face because uh, somebody points out um, there's some bogus assumption in, in the work. Um, and then you get to interpret the, the uh, peer review comments that come in, um, add, deci decide how to weigh them. And this all comes with you know, confidence and experience, uh, communicate with the authors, and you're their kind of your you're their shepherd to help them get the paper published. Um, then you may want to help uh, uh, communicate the significance and excitement of this work to a much broader audience. So if you're working for a journal that has a, a news and views section, maybe you get to write a commentary for that. Maybe you're writing the press release for that. Maybe you're just going to social media and using your channels to, to communicate and share your excitement. Maybe you get to um, you know, go, come on programs like this and talk about it. So um, it's not you're not just a passive person sitting in the background, but you can, with experience, play a much more active role in communicating the excitement and the importance of this work. And that's always what a part of the work that appealed to me is not just managing the peer review process in a sort of a passive role, but writing the news and views or writing the press release or being invited to give a talk at a forum like this about um, someone's work, because we are all, we all have a responsibility, I think, to be scientific communicators and help raise the profile of, of exciting work. So it's not just confined to the pages of a, of a, of a journal. Right. So like spreading the science, which, yeah, was something I hadn't thought about before your talk. It, 
it kind of like almost feels as a more static, um, dry reading and editing rather than, oh, I can actually get out there. And now we have so many different channels, um, like you said. Well, I think yeah, some of the, some of the editors that I've uh, worked with on that on that penultimate slide um, just love being editors. They love the, uh, the 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 task, the responsibility of evaluating papers. But in doing that, they are in many cases traveling the world and meeting and having dinner with famous scientists, and they are considered almost a, a peer to to scientists. That was one of the things I've noticed immediately upon joining Nature, but I think it's true of many other publishers. You, it's a, There's a little bit of an ego boost. You go from a struggling postdoc to somebody now who uh, they're taking your calls and they're inviting you over to their lab to have coffee and talk about science. And a lot of people want to be your friends. So that's a nice ego boost when, particularly if you've been struggling through a postdoc, you feel, why did I get into I mean, I went through many periods of, of doubting my career choices and uh, um, uh, and it was such a relief to then join nature and uh, feel, well, here's, you know, I can read, I can write about science, I can talk science with some famous scientists uh, across London or, or uh, overseas. Um, that What more do I want? I, I, I'd love to do that. Yeah. Actually, that sounds very encouraging because it's kind of like what you said, you're a postdoc, you're stuck, experiments work or not work. Your PI might not even be replying to your emails. And then what you are now presenting us with is a completely like shift of the tables, right? So that's- Yes, I have certainly had, uh, yes, I, I, I've had, I've had PIs swear at me when experiments weren't working and- um, uh, uh, so it, it was very nice uh, to to when you when you're now representing a, 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 a almost any journal, I think uh, a lot of scientists are going to give you the time. They're going to invite you into their office uh, uh, because uh, they want to they want to know when they're sending their paper over to a you know, Nature or Science or one of the cell journals. They really would like to know who they're communicating with. Um, right. And I think that's also another important point. I think actually it is important to point this out because um, staying in science, as in, in the lab-based science, it's sometimes for, you know, as that we, we don't know what it is like to be in a career outside of the lab. I, I have to confess, I think I'm still staying in the lab-based um, scientific world because I always think that this is the only way you can brainstorm and like read and learn more. And But now with like that outlook you're providing us with, it almost feels like you probably have even more access to scientists to discuss um, their science because, you know, you are now considered more important in how you can influence and affect their career yeah. in public. Yeah. In this and I think it's, as, as I showed on that penultimate slide, it's a nice uh, stepping stone. Some of my friends have just stayed as, as uh, editors at different journals, Nature, the American Journal of Medicine or wherever, uh, Science Translational Medicine, another one. Um, and they are just really happy uh, evaluating papers, shepherding them through the peer review process, and then hoping to see them kind of take off in the media and, and gain recognition right. not only for the scientists and for their work of course but by extension for for your journal as well i mean that was the fun, that was a fun part of being the founding editor of nature genetics um but uh uh it's it's uh, you get to broaden your horizons from being a, a postdoc um so you do get to uh kind of stay in your channel whether i really felt only I only felt qualified in any respect trying to judge papers in human genetics, but nature said, well, we can't just have a human genetics editor. You need to take on some other subjects as well. Um, so, so I did that, but I found it a very uh, stimulating uh, career. And then as I showed in that penultimate slide, people have either stayed in that area because they love it um, or they've used it as a springboard to branch out into working for a leading uh, foundation um, or some institute, because uh, there are you know, many of the skills that you develop um, in by experience in evaluating papers and communicating science are equally uh, translatable to uh, being the, the sort of the senior administrator at a, at a leading um, you know, Harvard department or, or new institute or, or foundation. 
Um, so, sorry, very quickly, I just want to remind um, the people on YouTube to keep sending uh, their questions because very soon I'm going to pass it on to Vanessa so they, um, she can read out the questions. Um, I'm very glad you brought up what you felt like you were qualified enough to review or edit, etc. Because um, I am currently a postdoc and I'm just about keeping up with the literature on my very specialized field. And a lot of times I feel like, oh, okay, I should have known this or I should have thought about it. It, it almost feels impossible to keep up with the science in my extremely <laughs> narrow scientific field. So how, and then, you know, your role will be to have such a broad understanding and knowledge, not just from like the specialized thing that you've been working on, but you know, from so many different topics. Okay, sure, it is not nature, it is nature genetics, but still it is very broad. So how do you keep up with it? How like, it feels like one needs to have so much knowledge. Um Yes, yes and no, but my role as an editor is is not to be uh, the, the font of all genetics knowledge. I couldn't possibly. Um, there may be some of my peers at other uh, yeah, different publishers and, and so, you, know, you may have that that uh, skill set. And I can think of some of the colleagues um, at other other publishers or other journals who, who do have sort of encyclopedic knowledge. That wasn't my attribute at all. Um, I just felt I had some good taste to say if I, I wanted to publish papers and still want to publish papers at the CRISPR journal that I feel are really interesting or groundbreaking um, or advance the field and obviously the the metrics that are perhaps a, 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 a nature journal or nature itself are a little different than for a startup journal like uh, the CRISPR journal, but you're pretty much asking the same questions and it's not your job as an editor to necessarily be the scientific um, uh, uh, expert on every facet of the, of the work of the field that you're covering, whether it's a, a, a technology like CRISPR or it's you know a, a huge subsection of biology at, at science or cell or nature. Um, so you're more the shepherd, you're the guide that um, certainly has to have a sense of whether a particular piece of work that's being submitted is a significant advance. That's a, that was one important metric. Is this an advance on the field? And two, if you're, particularly if you're at a, a publisher like Nature, is this of general interest? Mm -hmm. Is this something that you feel, is this a story if we publish it, that people who are not in signal transduction or CRISPR, that perhaps a physicist will read and enjoy or get something out of it. Um, and even if in practical terms, that's most unlikely to happen, at least you go through that exercise to say, because a journal like Nature is getting, or science is getting bombarded with great papers. And so the decisions about which papers to accept or which to maybe uh, decline, but say this might be better for Nature physics or Nature mm -hmm. this or that, uh, that, that does come down to the editorial team. So uh, it's really about just having some good taste and being trying to be consistent. It's not that you suddenly automatically become a, uh, uh, you know, the world expert in signal transduction or, or cancer pathogenesis that you can quote every, every detail. Rather, your job is to just sort of have good taste and be consistent and know to ask certain questions um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and of course, try to recruit. Uh, you, it's not just being passive. Sometimes we would get very active uh, and try to woo the best papers. I don't do that for the CRISPR journal right now because I know that if, if uh, one of the, the big names in the field or anybody in the field has a really exciting uh, advance in gene editing, nature, cell, science are gonna be the logical journals and venues for them to publish that. Um, but uh, every month I feel we get another paper that's just a little bit more exciting. We just had a paper we published uh, from Beam Therapeutics, uh, a publicly traded company in the Boston area on a, a advance in a sickle cell gene editing. This is not in patients yet, but it's a, a very promising new uh, route to directly altering the sickle cell mutation. And I've, 
we really enjoyed publishing this. We put it on the cover of the journal. And I feel that years from now, people may look back on that and say, that was a great paper. And that gives me a lot of, a lot of pride. Um, and uh, we'll slowly but surely begin to build the momentum for the, for the journal and hopefully allow us one day in the years ahead to kind of, um, maybe this is a little naive, but hopefully take on, on nature and science uh, and give them a run for their money. I don't know. Actually, it's very heartwarming to see someone who started as a lab-based scientist and with such like an in-depth academic career, you know, to have found a talent you clearly didn't know you had and a passion. You, I mean, you know, you did a change in your career. So that is really heartwarming to see how you actually just by looking around and seeing what other options are there that you can find a lot of things about your own passions and talents that you maybe were not exploiting because you were just like in that route that is yeah I, I don't mind you know I have I really have never missed holding up a pet or you know <laughs> dropping little solutions into rows of Eppendorf tubes I don't miss that at all um, but it, it is a, a, a it is a great privilege to have a career in science publishing where you get to I mean there, there can be some sort of silly bits of, of the business too but um, for the most part you get to think about science and communicating science and broadcasting exciting science to a much wider audience than just the the, the researchers in your field so um it's a very uh, stimulating uh, uh and uh, fun uh, career you get to travel you get to hang out with some very cool scientists and uh, very important scientists um and uh um it's, uh, yeah, so I've had no regrets from stepping away from the bench. And I've, but I do know some people who went into publishing and then one or two have decided, you know what, I, I, I miss the bench. I miss the visceral thrill of making that discovery. So uh, you can, I can think of one or two folks who have actually gone back. And um, uh, uh, so uh, it's not a one way street as I hopefully showed on that slide. Yeah, for sure you did. And one last question because before I pass it on to Vanessa, and it's a selfish question. Now that we have you here, uh, what are like a, a few good tips for like getting published, getting noticed, or like good academic writing? Well, I think um, uh, that's a that's a, a a great question. I mean, I think. For the big journals, sometimes we jokingly refer to them as the glamour journals, Cell, Nature, and Science. Um, you know, when you submit a paper to those elite journals, obviously they're going to be vetted and read uh, with a critical eye by one or more um, folks like me. I mean, that's the first barrier to entry. So um, very useful is a, um, a cover letter that in plain English explains why is this work of general interest? I mean, why, why should you care? Why should you want to publish this? Why is this so important? And you as the author, uh, or the lead scientist, you've really got to be able to ask that question, not just to get a paper published in a top journal, but really to support um, your, your line of work. If, you're, if you can't answer those questions, then maybe you should think about whether um, the sacrifices that you make doing biomedical research uh, is, is the right career for you. Um, and we, we all know, you all know, um, that you, you have to make a lot of sacrifices in your time and, and dedication to, to do the work that you're doing. Um, so uh, ask, ask, that, ask that question and um, uh, yeah. Okay, so then the take home message is really to be able to communicate why this is important, why it's adding to the current scientific knowledge. And it's just like plain way that not obviously your protein and your nucleotide why these are important but what is it adding to like the bigger picture and well if, why you, if you yeah if you if you really want to aspire to get that glamour journal on your cv then by by definition your work has to be of general interest to people outside of your particular field if you can't make that argument in a cover letter um then maybe you shouldn't be trying to publish in science or or nature or cell um but of course, as I emphasized in my remarks, um, there are so many more, um, you know, glamour journals or journals published by the, the glamour publications, you know, cells launching spin-offs pretty much every year, Nature uh, Science has launched some new, newer journals uh, in, in the recent times. 
Um, but there are well, uh, very satisfying uh, jo jobs, positions for professional editors at a growing number of other publishers. Uh, uh, Embo yeah, will employ professional yeah. publishers and editors. Um, Frontiers. Uh, so it doesn't, I, I focused on cell nature science, the, you know, the big three, but um, I also wanted to make clear that um, there's a more and more uh, publishers, uh, eLife uh, in the UK, um, Current Biology, uh, so, um, and that's one of the exciting things, that there's just a so many more opportunities um, than you know when I was applying back in 1989, 1990. So, um, and many people who've been in the field for 10, 20 plus years um, have have enjoyed it and stayed it. And look at the current the you know, the new editor of uh, the, the the current editor of Nature, Magdalena Skipper, who had a similar career journey to me. I did a postdoc, grew a little frustrated. Um, unsatisfied, joined Nature Publishing as an assistant editor for uh, one of the review journals, and then sort of moved around within the Nature family, found herself at Nature, left and went to do something else, and then came back, and then obviously had all the right uh, attributes to be appointed um, uh, Phil Campbell's successor uh, two or three years ago. Okay. Well, thank you for, for sharing your story. Uh, I wish we had seen like more videos of your band. You know that. that <laughs> no, you don't. Maybe, uh, maybe, <laughs> and glad to hear you also made it to Hollywood, you know, from like holding a pipette to also making it to yeah. Hollywood. Almost. <laughs> but, uh, up to you. <laughs> so thank you from my side, Kevin. It was really, really so fascinating watching you chronicle your journey because it always seems like you were in the right place at the right time. Of course, you put in the work, but because of your work and where you are, you, you had access to opportunities. And I find that quite interesting. And you mentioned that in a way you didn't have so much mentor experience. So how, how important is that? What advice would you give to young researchers to really seek out having a mentor? And does your mentor have to be associated with the field you're trying to get into or just someone who is a professional who can give you a broad range of advice? On yeah, that. yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, I had uh, uh, two dynamic, brilliant scientists as my PhD mentor and then as my uh, postdoctoral supervisor. Um, but uh, neither one sort of encouraged me to go into science publishing. Um, and I felt a little bit badly about sort of deciding to hang up the, the lab coat and the, the, you know, the Gilson pipette uh, for the last time. Um, almost sort of, you know, I, I wanted to be a star researcher. I'm sort of admitting defeat. But this was just something I was better at. I had more fun talking about science and trying to communicate science in a, in a broader setting. So... Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad I made the change, but as you saw in my quick uh, uh, summary, um, I had no, there was no formal training other than taking the leap to write an article for New Scientist magazine. And I'm sure waving that magazine about um, in my nature interview uh, back in 1989. And even getting a, a little bit of a, a re rebuke from the biology editor, Miranda Robertson, who said, uh, 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 Kevin, you do realize this is not a writing job. This is an editing job you're looking for. So I very sheepishly sort of put my new scientist uh, reprint uh, back in my back in my uh, briefcase and um, pretended I hadn't even <laughs> you know, <laughs> shown, shown it around the table. Um, so, uh, you know, it's about having a, a passion for science and talking science and everybody watching this I'm, has that. And sort of weighing the pros and cons of, you know, how badly do I want to be doing experiments and pipetting colorless liquids from tube A to tube B for the rest of my life, or much of much more of my life, yeah. versus um, taking a step back, um, evaluating the best science of whatever publisher or whatever journal I'm with, traveling to meetings, talking about mm -hmm. science. It just seemed, at least from from my skill set, whatever that is, a better use of my time and a, and a more fun way of approaching it, rather than running endless experiments that uh, I sort of knew even before I started were sort of doomed to failure. 
Um, so it was a great relief for me. Um, and, you know, over 30 years, I've worked at, uh, I've done other, you know, other forms of science writing and I've moved into trying to write uh, best-selling books. Some of them have quite become bestsellers, but, you know, one lives in hope. Um, and, uh, uh, but as I sh showed on that slide, that taking that move into a journal publishing position then sort of seems to open up, you know, the fork in the road sort of materializes in front of you and can be used as a stepping stone into many other different things from administration to uh, becoming a, a fully fledged uh, author. Um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities that it provides. So if you're going, going in, if someone is considered going into scientific writing, for example, yeah. or editing or publishing, how much writing experience do you actually need and does this experience have to be only within science or can you have experience outside of science that would be considered um, valuable that you can um, be able to break into this kind of um, yeah. area? I, I don't think you need to have writing experience, but it, when I've looked at, uh, because somebody can come to me, I, have, I can think of examples in the past where uh, candidates have, um, uh, applied for uh, editorial positions mm -hmm. and um, yeah, walk through my door. And sometimes it's just an intangible feeling you get after five minutes, uh, you know, this person is the right candidate for the job. I just, I love everything about them. Um, mm -hmm. And and then, you know, we'll kind of go through the motions for two hours <laughs> to pretend we're doing an interview. But sometimes I get that sort of just visceral feeling that I know I will enjoy working with this person and they they have the the attributes whether it's having some good first author papers in their resume that's important but that's not the only thing and if that had been the metric by which I was judged when I went to the nature interview right. I, I wouldn't be here on this uh, talking to you right. so um but I do I think it's useful sometimes you get candidates who've got a really good resume they publish some great first author papers so they're clearly very very smart knowledgeable scientists but they haven't done anything beyond that to kind of show that they have a, a, an aptitude or an interest mm -hmm. in communicating science mm -hmm. and so often I think if there's a, a job opening I'm looking for somebody who has at least tested the waters and maybe shown in some way that their world hasn't just been about publishing, trying to publish in, in peer review journals, but maybe they've tried to do something or maybe there's a, a just a, a, a YouTube video of a talk that they've given somewhere that um, really shows their aptitude for science communication and interpreting complex subjects. Um, or maybe they've, they've tried writing some sort of uh, mini review or news and views. Uh, uh, and of course, the good thing now is that there are so many more journals that have front matter that are looking for young authors to write commentaries about cool papers that, that may have just been published somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So if you see an opportunity like that, I would say, and you have a, you'd like to test the waters about being a, a science editor or some sort of science communicator, then, then go for it. And don't be shy about pitching a proposal to a journal. Um, you know, if you're a, a, a postdoc working in a, in a smallish lab um, that isn't getting nature papers every month, um, you know, you may have to wait a long time before an, an, a, an editor at Cell kind of, you know, he sends you an email to say, would you like to write a perspective for us? So pitch one. What's the worst they can do? Say no? Okay, fine. You take, yeah, you know, we all get rejected uh, in life. So go bounce back, dust yourself off and, and yeah. go for the next one. Um, be brave. And yeah. Okay. So, you know, in your presentation, you mentioned that, of course, when you started more than 30 years ago, there were very limited journals. Now the field has evolved with so many different publishing houses and journals and different media in which you can communicate scientific content. But do you find that the scientific writing itself has also evolved over the last 30 years? Is it the way... Does the way we communicate science remain the same because the data is the data, you present it the exact same, or how has this changed and how can you adapt to the changes if there are any? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there are many more uh, venues now to, um, uh, to uh, explore uh, writing options or, and of course, many more places where you can, you can um, 
launch your career uh, as an editor. Some people enjoy the editing process, just the reading of manuscripts and evaluating and don't particularly care to actually express themselves in writing. Others love the, the, the latter, the, the communication, the writing part of the equation, assimilating information, but then getting picking up the phone and calling uh, experts to, to comment and, um, uh, uh, and increasingly uh, not relying on peer review papers, but uh, you know, now you have the world of preprints that you can, you can you know, mine through for, for story ideas or, 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 or mine other sources. Um, so uh, uh, I, you know, I think there's there's just so many uh, uh, good opportunities and many different flavors of work. So many more journals now that uh, whether you want to be just an editor shepherding papers or more of a writer or more of a hybrid position, um, uh, you think of the, there's so many more publishers that are hiring um, PhD level or postdoc level um, scientists. Um, so I, there's a, there's a wealth of more opportunities now than there were, you know, when I was making this decision 30, 30 ish years ago. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I want to ask you, you know, from my side, do you think it's fair or it makes sense for a young researcher to say, okay, I don't want to be in the lab anymore. I don't want to be a benchmark scientist, but they need to get a stepping stone to something else. And as you mentioned, this is really a good branching point if you get into scientific publishing or writing. Is that a good enough reason knowing that you're going into it with the aim of doing something else? Is it okay to have this kind of mindset or would you say, no, you have to figure out what you want first and directly go for that? Do you mean um, using scientific editing as a stepping stone yeah. for, I, I mean, I think it, 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 it gives you, as I showed on that penultimate slide, it, it gives you, it gives you some options. So first of all, it removes you from the bench and mm -hmm. some of the people watching may just not be getting the visceral excitement and thrills that they once did donning the lab coat and trying that experiment for the fifth time that you, you're just not that excited about the result anymore. And if you're having some of those um, doubts, then I think publishing is a, certainly an, a, a, a one, an option worth, um, worth considering. Um, and as I showed in that slide, it can be a stepping stone to many other careers because it's it, that step of leaving the bench, but now thinking about science in a more, perhaps a more slightly more expressive, more public way. Um, those skills, as I showed on that slide, can mm -hmm. in turn be a stepping stone to to move into um, forms of administration at a foundation, or you know, more and more departments need a sort of a, a someone to help you know manage the grant submission mm -hmm. process. Process. So I think it's a valuable stepping stone. Um, some become have such a flair for science writing that they just then move into into that line of work, um, and some get out of science altogether. Ne they never lose their love for science, but just decide, you know what, I'd rather become a professional violinist or something like that. So um, uh, I don't think it's any, you know, be carving out a career as a bench scientist and then a faculty scientist in academia, it's tough. We all know it's tough. You have to make sacrifices of your time and maybe family. Um, and I don't think anyone should feel any uh, stigma or, or disappointment about feeling that they've reached a crossroads and it's maybe time to think about something different. And the beauty of the sorts of things we've been talking about the last hour is that a career in science publishing, whether more as a writer or more as an editor, or maybe as a sort of public communicator, uh, communication officer, you know, you're still in science. You still feel the thrill of discovery. Um, you're just not having to make quite the same uh, sacrifices uh, and you know, long weekends in a dark room or <laughs> in a in a in a bench watching a centrifuge spin or whatever. Um, uh, so it's a perhaps a slightly better work life balance, and you're able to live this live um, kind of uh, uh, through the uh, through the eyes of of other people uh, helping communicate and channel their science. So. Um, uh, and I had so many more opportunities now, of course, than there were 20, 30 years ago. Okay.
Thank you. So um, with that, that's the last question from my side. And I would just like to say to everyone on the live, if you didn't get to ask your question live, of course, you have an opportunity to email them to us at ecrs at esgct.eu. Um, of course, you can always come back and uh, watch the presentation on our YouTube page, where you will also see Kevin's um, email address. He also put his contact information there on his slides, so you will always be able to come back and get the information. Um, so from my side, I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining. Thank you to Kevin um, for really such a wonderful presentation and giving young researchers some hope that you shouldn't feel disappointed because you don't have the the loose, the joy for bench work science anymore. And it doesn't make you less of a scientist. And I think especially with a field like this, with the scientific publishing, it's also much easier to go back to the lab in this area because you're still so close to the science. You're, you still have to really keep in touch with the trends in science. You have to keep abreast of all the current research, whereas if you're in other industry positions, it's, it's much more difficult to go back to the lab. But I think the nature of this type of job makes it easier. So it's not a be all end all that if you leave the lab now, you decide that at this point in my life, I no longer want to be running experiments and you try scientific publishing, it means you can't go back in this way. It's actually much easier for you to go back because you're still so connected to the research. And I think that's something that might appeal to a lot of young people, a lot of researchers actually, that they have more options just in case later on they wanna, they wanna try their hands at some experiments again if they come up with an idea and they want to give it a shot. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really fascinating and, and we thank you for your input for sure. I've, I've loved uh, uh, chatting with you and I wish everyone watching uh, every success, whether it's uh, at the bench or if their career takes a, a step away, um, uh, all the best. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I personally really appreciated the attitude, uh, primarily, you know, negotiate more, <laughs> appreciate yourself more, believe in yourself more. And sometimes, you know, like try, try writing. I think we just are a bit scared of the writing and publishing just also because it is kind of like the end point of, you know, wrapping up uh, a project. And I don't know, that, that advice of, trying negotiating more for yourself but also try new things and rediscover like things about yourself you didn't you weren't aware you were that talented in I think it was just like a very positive uh, message so thank you for your time and thank you everyone for joining us and for sharing your questions we will see you again next month uh, we will advertise um, our event our next event very shortly and yeah Stay in touch, send us any uh, suggestions, recommendations, ideas, and thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye.